All right, welcome everyone to this professional event lunch talk. We're gonna have our grad student panel today. Uh, so we can first go ahead and start off and just you guys can introduce yourselves and what you're studying and how long you've been at GMU for. Yes, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Jeffrey McCaig. Um, I've been at GMU for almost a year now. I think it's probably like been eight months, my first year of PhD study. Um, and I study active galactic nuclei and in particular, polar gas coming off of active galactic nuclei. So if you're ever interested in that, talk to me. Uh, hi, I'm Melissa Beershank. I'm a first year PhD student as well. Um, and I also study AGN. <laughs> I'm Catherine Fernandez. I'm a second year PhD student and I do physics education research. So like that weird topic on the side. I'm Luis Fernandez, um, her husband. Uh, I am a third year PhD student here at George Mason University. Uh, I'm also studying AGNs and I'm just trying to figure out all the stuff that involved with that especially the corona. I'm Kevin Collins. I'm a second year PhD student and I am studying exoplanets and trying to find them around other stars. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. So we've already gotten some questions. I think I've shown you a little bit earlier from when we did this last semester and also just questions that we've gotten regularly from undergrads. Um, so, I, so I think we should just start going through those. Um, so first, how much does a GRE score influence grad school applications? Okay, so I'll just be the first to say it shouldn't, but sometimes it does. <laughs> um, the GRE is not, wasn't created as like a cutoff measure of like who gets accepted and who gets rejected, but sometimes schools use it like that. Um, I do know that since the pandemic, a lot more schools have been making it optional or not even asking for it at all, which is really great, but it's just more indicative of your race and social economic status than anything. It doesn't really predict success in grad school. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, even, even before the pandemic, there are plenty of schools that didn't require the, the physics GRE. Um, so I, I would say, I would agree that it doesn't really matter that much. It certainly would, might help if you did have a really high score, but if you, if you don't, I don't think that would be a bad thing. Yeah, it won't, it won't prevent you from finding somewhere, although unfortunately, the reality is some places do still use it, uh, maybe in lieu of some other different things to, to measure you by, just because the application environment has gotten so much more competitive over the last several years, and more and more people are applying, and less and less people are getting in uh, some admissions groups do use it in ways that it wasn't designed to be used. Uh, so it does matter in some places, but uh, it's not the end of the world if you didn't do great. And talking about the competition of grad school and everything, uh, can you guys share any advice about how many schools and how you should kind of figure out what schools to apply to? Um. I would suggest applying to as many as you can <laughs> um, financially for one, because it is a lot of money, but um, I, I would suggest applying to some of your like reach schools. My old advisor called them reach schools and then some like safety schools uh, just to kind of give you a range because like like you all said they are they can be really competitive especially some of the like top tier schools so yeah apply to a bunch um one thing to also make note of is not just about the name recognition of the school because you also want to make sure that they have the research you want to do 
because some schools may be, you know, a top tier level school, but the research that they're doing may not coincide with what you want as well. So keep that in mind. I'd also say keep in mind the area that the school is in because your happiness above all will be most important above all. And you want to be in an area where you think you can be happy and you think you can actually thrive. So also make sure, like, I don't know, if you don't want to be in the middle of the desert in New Mexico, don't apply to University of New Mexico. Nothing against University of New Mexico, but, uh, you know, yeah, that's keep a great that in mind. Point, <laughs> this actually brings us to another question, too, is what should people be looking for in a, in a good school? I mean, we brought up the research aspect. We brought up just general locality and how you fit in there. What else did you guys look at when you were deciding where to go? Um, well, one of the things that I looked at when deciding which schools I wanted to even apply to uh, was I looked at the research that people were doing. Um, like I wanted to do astrophysics, and so I, I uh, you know, just went onto the physics website for that university and looked at their research and looked at like every single professor to see what they were doing. And, um, you know, if, if they had like more than three people that were doing some sort of astrophysics research that seemed interesting, seemed interesting, then like that was a good one. If there was only like one, maybe two that I was kind of interested in, I kind of ch chunked that one away because, you know, if you, if you do end up going to that school and you think you want to do that research, and it doesn't work out, like maybe you end up not liking it or like you don't vibe with that professor, uh, then you end up being stuck. And uh, that is not how you want to end up. To add on to that some, and this applies both when looking for places to apply and once you have already applied, uh, do reach out. There's no reason not to send an email to a professor, talk to them, uh, reach out to some current students in particular, find out what the work culture of the department's like, uh, because that's that's something really important. You're gonna be immersed in this group of people for years if you're there. So you wanna make sure that it's the kind of place you wanna be in with the people you wanna be surrounded with. Uh, something to add is also check their funding situation to see how they pay their students, whether it's through grants, whether it's on teaching assistantship, to make sure that, you know, you're also taken care of as well while you're there. So we've got a question, I think, related to this from the forum. How do you reach out to professors without knowing them to ask if they're looking for students? And I imagine also to ask about funding and all of that. Where do you find that information? Well, I think you can pretty much find any faculty's email on the school's website. And you don't have to ask a ton of questions in your first email to them. You could just tell them that you're interested in applying to the school. You saw their like research website and you wanna find out more information. But another thing that's really easy to do is most if not all faculty like kind of link in their publications to their website or even to the department website. So you can always just see if they have any recent publications. That's probably a really good indicator that they have grants that they're working on at the moment. And I'll say as someone who's gotten from the student side, like Kevin was saying, a bunch of emails from prospective students, we're used to answering them. We're happy to answer any kind of questions that you have. We want you to be happy if you're here and you wanna make sure that's a good fit for you. So anything else for the uh, other, like what else to look for in a grad school? I think I hit everybody with that. Okay. Um, when should I start working on applications? Early. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of the times, um, or, or there are some applications that are due in December sometimes even like December 1st, 
And so a lot of these applications, or you know, all of them require uh, recommendation letters from like professors or um, something like that. And so you want to give them like at least a month, if not longer um, uh, of a notice uh, to ask them and get them to write you a recommendation letter. And so, so you want to like look into your schools and, and then have time to ask those professors you know, with that appropriate time frame before the, the due date. So, so pretty early on, probably looking, start looking into the schools like in the summer, maybe like August or so. Pretty much sums it up. The sooner the better, really, uh, once the applications have been released. Yeah, plus, I mean, like, as an undergrad or as a senior undergrad, I mean, I know how busy it can be. And the further away you start from the deadline, the more you can just work on it bit by bit and have it not pile up into this big ball of stress at the end. Um, and maybe if you're stressed, you don't write as well. Um, if you have to write like an essay or something. And also you forget to ask professors for recommendations and you don't want to be that person who waits the last second because I was that person and it wasn't good. So yeah, you definitely want to, I think what Melissa said, at least a month for your professors is a, is a good, uh, is a good time frame, frame for asking, asking for recommendations. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like the earlier on you have uh, more time to, to write on your uh, purpose statement because pretty much all of these um, physics programs asks you to write a statement of purpose. And so if you can write a better, a better statement of pur purpose, which I've learned is really important because that's just you telling your story, um, then, then it's a better application. And so now moving on to actual ins and outs of grad school. Uh, one question we got is, where is it? Uh, Oh, how do grad classes compare to your undergrad classes as far as content, workload, and expectations? And do you have any recommendations for how to succeed in these grad classes? I know some of you are in classes right now, so. <laughs> well, the one thing, the big difference between undergraduate and graduate is after you do your undergraduate, you think you understand certain subjects very well. Like for instance, classical mechanics, you're like, oh, I know classical mechanics. And then you start classes and you start doing homework and you realize, wait, I don't really understand this subject as good as I thought I did. And just kind of be like humbled in that kind of sense. And the other thing is just making sure you talk with other students, build a community and realize that you can't do this on your own and that's okay because the difficulty that you think that you're that you should be able to do this by yourself is not true you actually need help to build on your understanding and that's okay yeah uh collaborative work is definitely far more encouraged and necessary than it was an undergraduate and uh also you can't get away with the same stuff you might have gotten away with an undergraduate. You need to start your homework early. You need to try and finish it early. Uh, that that one really short problem, uh, well, really short problem statement anyway, might end up being six pages long, and and you know you're going to get lost on the way. And if you're trying to do it all the night before, you are just not going to finish. But uh, the the uh, Give and take in that is ideally in a grad program, you're doing these hard, difficult problems in a subject you're actually interested in. Uh, so at least there's that. So um, you're not spending all this effort on something you're not interested in, at least. It gives you a deeper understanding of uh, the actual subject. Also, I'd say be prepared to know material that the teacher doesn't necessarily cover in detail in class. Like for example, I remember in my quantum class, we talked about one sub, my professor talked about one subject, maybe two, two or three lines in the notes, not even. And then we had a whole question on it in our exam and it was great. Um, so be prepared to really have to master the material in order to do well, but you can do it. It's not that scary.
Okay. Um, how do stipends work? How do you get a TA or an RA and what are kind of the expectations for each role? I think stipends, they, they definitely range like on the location and just how much funding the school has, but on average, it's between 20 and 30,000 a year. Um, but at least at Mason, our stipends are only like during the academic year. So your summer funding is separate from what you're kind of promised in your package, but we get 22,000 a year for, for nine months, technically not a year. Um, and then I think if you get a TA, it's included in your offer letter and like we have to sign contracts so you know what you're getting into, but sometimes you have to figure it out as you go and then you have like tons of different meetings. There's always meetings, whether you're a TA or an RA, so many meetings. <laughs> And uh, usually, um, like you said, the, the TA position is normally given to you in an offer letter. Uh, and in order to get a RA, a research assistantship, uh, you normally have to find another source of funding for that, uh, either through, well, through grants and through finding um, a research group that has funding to pay for you to do research. Uh, and the the time obligations are in theory supposed to be the same because it's uh, it's understood that you're working through classes and things, uh, but the rest of your working time it should be dedicated towards either your teaching obligations or your research obligations. Uh, and teaching normally uh, TAs will be in charge of a few lab courses or things and, and grading for classes, that sort of thing. And one thing I'll say that was told to me when I was applying is that if a place wants you, they're going to find assistantship or some kind of position where they're they're covering your tuition, they're cover they're they're paying you your stipend and everything. If that's pretty standard in grad school, so that's not happening. Um, that usually means that there's something very different, difficult financial stuff in the in the university, and it's may not be worth it basically. Yeah, you should never ever have to pay for your physics PhD. That's just like straight up a scam. Like don't don't sign up for that. Um, and then I think like what Kevin was saying, I think the workload expectation is the same. So we're contracted to work 20 hours a week. And I know in grad school, typically the expectation is traditionally across all schools and departments that you just keep on working past those 20 hours, but it can become a little bit unhealthy for you just like mentally and then you can get burnt out easily if you work past that. So it's important to have a relationship with your advisor, at least like with a support group of grad students that you can talk to each other and find a way to like set like work life balance, even though that's kind of difficult to attain sometimes. And kind of add to that. Um with that kind of expectation is remember the reason why you're in grad school, what's your priorities. And the first thing you have to make sure is that you pass your classes because it doesn't matter how good you do in your job. If you're failing your classes, you will be kicked out. So remember that your priorities. So your focus should be that. And then after you're done with your classes, then you can really focus more on your research. So to make sure that you kind of prioritize that as well. And as far as funding, Sometimes you can get funding from outside sources, like for instance, me, I'm also collaborating with the United States Naval Observatory and they're actually, uh, I'm contracted with them as well to, and they're helping me pay for school. So your grants can come from any places as well, depending on what your research is. And then on that note, how early should you start research? And what if you don't really know what you want to do? How do you kind of figure it out on that time scale? Well, I'll say that it's so personally, I came in and I started doing research right away, but I know it's completely normal. And I'd say it's most commonly the case that people come into grad school not necessarily knowing what they want to study. 
Um, a lot of people are, are TAs and go through classes. And as they're going through their, their TA, they are surveying all the professors, what they're doing research in. And then they event, once they finish classes, they eventually start doing re more concentrated research. Um, but it's completely normal to not know what you want to study coming in. At least that's my experience talking to people. And if you're really not sure, you can talk to a professor and try and join their group and do some research for a semester or a year and see, just see firsthand if you like it or not. And if you end up not liking it and you want to switch, that's okay. That's, there's, there's no reason not to try something. And then, you know, then you know. If you don't like it, you can try something else. There is some time in grad school to actually figure out what you're there to do. Yeah, Kevin, that's a great point. And like, that goes back to like, how you know you're at an institution that you should be happy at is that like, they're understanding and they just wanna make you happy and want you to do research that you that you like. So that's, that's also a good uh, way of knowing that, hey, I'm at the right institution, they really care about me. Um, something you can also do is just join meetings and just see what other people are doing and just sitting in those meetings. You don't necessarily have to be doing hands-on research. You can literally just be listening to the what people are doing, how they're doing it, and just kind of just get yourself involved. Like for me, I didn't really do research, research until after going out of my second year here at George Mason. But I was sitting in on the meetings. I was listening to all the different things, and that kind of helped me build more of really what I was mostly interested in. And I can also say as far as like switching partway through grad school and everything, my partner took him, it took him three projects, which project basically until he found the one that he ultimately basically stuck with him and that he stayed with. And he was successful. He got NPP like at, at, or worked at Goddard and everything. Like it's, it doesn't hold you back basically if you, just keep bringing your passion, your effort towards it. So also tangentially to this, how do you find a PhD product and thesis advisor? And does the department typically help you with that? I guess I would just say, um... Finding, finding an advisor, just like, you know, kind of what we have been saying, just talking to professors and, you know, seeing what they're doing, listening in, you know, sitting in on those meetings and uh, also asking if they are available to take in students, because I guess it's possible that they might not be. Um, so just don't be afraid to talk to professors and ask them what's up. <laughs> I think also finding out who the students are in like your potential advisors group and talking to them because you can find out a lot about kind of like what, how conversations go, how team meetings are run. And because sometimes you might be really interested in the specific research that an advisor is doing, but if their personality or the way that they run their group doesn't really work with how you like to work, maybe you're more of an independent person and then they're very, very structured, that might not work for you. So you should also take that into account and not just what the research focus is. Yeah, Kat, I think that's a great point. Uh, and I just wanna say that, Jenna, I remember you and Ryan taking Melissa and I around campus on that first tour, almost a year ago now. And we were able to talk to you about what it was like being in the group sort of away from Shibita and any professors. So, and that was just a really good way for us to get like, to know like, will we, is this a good group? Is it like nice? Is it fun? Are they nice? Like it, it was just, so talking to other students is a really good way to know what actually goes on. And so Kat touched on this a little bit, but can you guys uh, give some advice on what are the signs of a good PhD advisor when you do actually look for one? Um, I'll say, uh, you know, if, if they are checking up on you, um, 
not just on your research, like they're checking in on you to see if you're okay. <laughs> um, you know, and if you feel like, if you feel like you're not doing okay and you feel like you would be able to reach out to that advisor and, and just be like, I need to vent to you. If, if you feel like you're comfortable doing that, that, I feel like that is a good sign in a, uh, an advisor. Because sometimes you, you can't reach out to everyone. But I think that's important if you can reach out to your advisor. Um, yeah. I'd also say patience, definitely patience in an advisor, knowing that research is hard. If you're just starting out, it might take you a while to find your footing and they won't rip you for that. Patience is a very big, big thing to look for an advisor. And on the research side of things, you want an advisor that won't just give you work to do and give you a project to work on, but will facilitate you doing the research that you are actually interested in. If you're interested in something in particular, uh, you want an advisor that will help you look into that and find a research project that aligns your goals with the interests of the group as well, to just kind of incorporate your interests into your research instead of just working on a project because that's what they were working on and now you're the person doing it. I think it's also important to find someone who's willing to advocate for you because sometimes you might find yourself in a situation where there's a power dynamic and you could really use a faculty member on your side <clears throat> to kind of just support what you're trying to get done. And faculty members are also human and sometimes they make mistakes. But I think if you do happen to be in a situation where like your advisor messes up or doesn't handle something in the best possible way, if they're able to own up to that and apologize and like try to do right by you in the future. I think that also speaks a lot about them and their character. So that's also something that you can look for. Okay. And then what do you recommend for a good work-life balance? <laughs> kind of telling that nobody's responding to this one yet <laughs> well yeah oh yeah go ahead Luke. well i was gonna say uh the one thing for sure is to make sure you have time for yourself and because you can burn out very easily very quickly and by the time you figure it out you're burned out it's already too late um talking with other students to kind of like see what everybody else is going through to kind of like help you understand where you are and where everybody else is to make sure that you're not alone in what you're feeling. Um, so part of that is just literally setting yourself time for yourself. Yeah, um, a past advisor of mine gave me some advice that was um, like, don't, don't let school and work um, push away like your hobbies. Like if you have hobbies that you really enjoy, then you should still try to make time for that because you know that's that's something you really enjoy. It's kind of stress relieving. And doing something that relieves stress can help you in your school and your work. Like you can come, you know, take a break from school and work and go do whatever your hobby is, do some exercise or play the guitar or something. And relieve some stress and then when you come back like you're, you're coming to it with an open mind so um so yeah make time for your hobbies yeah i'll say you definitely need to prioritize your own happiness above everything else um you need to make time like melissa said for hobbies if you just want to sit down and chill out you need to make time for that because school and work can so easily overtake anything. Like I could spend all day, if I'm concentrating, I can spend all day just sitting here at my desk and doing something and completely forget anything about me time. And then for the next three days, I'm like, holy crap, I'm actually burned out. Like Lewis said, I, I realized I had burned myself out before I realized it. So, and, and specifically how I do it is I have a Google calendar and I schedule times for me, like hobby time, Jeffrey time or swim time. Cause I've, I've 
I, I'm starting to swim again. So you need to specifically schedule, well, maybe if that's not you, don't do it, but you need to prioritize your own happiness above all. I will say that it takes practice and time and you have to like kind of be gentle with yourself because especially if you're starting grad school, no one expects you to have it all figured out and be like, oh, I have mastered this work-life balance thing and I'm crushing it. Like, I don't think anyone's really crushing it, but you know, sometimes what works for you for like a semester, like a hobby or certain activity, then another semester comes around and that's just like not, you're not feeling de-stressed anymore and you need to change it up. That's perfectly fine. It's okay to just give yourself time to figure out what works. And sometimes it's just like binging Netflix or like just having like a sitcom playing while you're trying to do something that doesn't require like all your brain power. Just like anything helps and taking breaks, definitely. Yeah, and it's very important to have a support system, people to talk to, like Lewis said, um, I know the physics grad students have a weekly happy hour, which recently has been virtual, but still very important in having time to talk to people going through the same thing and having uh, someone to tell you, hey, you need to take a break. You can't just do this forever. Uh, sit down and watch TV or have dinner with me or lunch. And uh, you, you, need, you need other people, I think, is the main thing, or else you're going to forget what's best for you. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, it's, it, you're, you're not gonna always feel like 100% all the time. And so I think that's important, like just, I guess, just adding on to that to um, not be afraid to reach out to people because I know it can be scary, um, but you're gonna feel like a hundred times better once you do. So just reach out to people when you're not feeling amazing um, and, and just vent. Sometimes you just need to vent. Yeah, friends are so important in grad school. Friends are cool. Yeah, exactly. It's just so great. Like even in this pandemic situation, doing homework in the Discord, but also complaining about it, but it's kind of therapy in that in that way, you know. So that sort of helps. But knowing that everyone else is going through what you're going through, it's just it's great to have friends. So bringing up how everything is virtual right now, and we're not sure what's going to be happening in the fall and in the future, basically. Do any of you who have particularly been taking classes during this time, do you have any advice for students who are starting? how to find their people, how to find these study groups when you're not, you can't just look to the person next to you basically and ask if they want to study. Oh, I was muted, sorry. I'd say don't be afraid to just send someone an email. Like, I think, Melissa, help me if, I, if I'm remembering this incorrectly, but I think Logan just sent us an email saying, hey, do you want to study? And we, we already sent, set up a Discord for our study group. And he's like, hey, do you guys want to study together anytime? And I was like, heck yeah, get in here. So don't- Yeah, so it was just like, I've noticed that we're taking the same classes. Like, mm -hmm. here, let me know if you want to study. And I was like, all right, add him in. <laughs> yeah. So don't be afraid to just cold open on someone and say, hey, you guys want to email, start a Discord server, you know, pl shameless plug for Discord, but- don't be afraid to do it. It's everyone is looking for that study buddy. Yeah. Just gotta, just gotta reach out. It's, it's scary, but like, you're just gonna, you know, it's the same thing, even if it wasn't in person, like it might be a little scary to like tap the person on the shoulder, like, Hey, do you want to like get together and work on this homework? Um, you know, it's the same thing except for just sending an email. And like they said, everyone is like struggling with these classes. Classes are hard and they're hard for a reason and they're harder than your undergrad classes. So like nine times out of 10, if not more, people are more than happy to bring more people to study group because the more minds you have at it, the easier and the faster things will go sometimes. 
Oh, also don't be afraid to not be the smartest person. I will say that as well. You're going to be surrounded by people who are smarter than you. And honestly, that's actually a very good thing. It will, it will bring your intelligence up. So by surrounding yourself with smarter people, it will make you smarter guaranteed. So don't, don't lose some of your pride in that, uh, in that aspect. A couple more as far as the applications. Um, is it normal to go visit a grad school you're thinking about applying to, or is that more of just an undergrad thing? Well, I mean, I guess as far as like the university inviting you for a tour, I know specifically with GMU, I didn't get that until I was accepted, I believe, which is different from undergrads where they just give tours to everyone, you know? Um, but I would also say, don't be afraid to just go somewhere. Cause again, like we said earlier, you had to be happy wherever the grad school is. Like you have to like the area around it. So I would hundred percent recommend doing tours of, your, of grad schools just by yourself even. Cause I, I definitely did that when I was applying to grad school that went all around all all the ones I was thinking about applying to and was like do I like it here eh, this place kind of sucks so that's what I did yeah uh, I mean I would definitely when I was applying I would I would I would look at the um like the surrounding city uh or town um honestly just check if there were lots of like restaurants because <laughs> um food is very important to me so um if there's lots of food options I think I would be happy there. I think like th there was uh, a couple years ago when I applied to some other places, it was in the middle of nowhere. Like there, there was only such a high population because of the university there. And so there was like nothing around. There wasn't even like great nature around. So that was, that one was a no for me, but um, yeah, I don't think it's a bad idea to just go on your own. I don't think they would like pay for it before you got accepted. And 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 not every university is going to pay for you if you do get accepted. Not every university is going to pay for you to come visit. Yeah, I think it also might depend on the like school and what their funding is, but sometimes they pay for like your flight and a hotel or sometimes you're given the option, but it's nice that if you have the option, you can always go and visit them when you're thinking of applying so that if it doesn't, like the area doesn't work out for you, you don't have to dedicate that time to an application. Um, but also I forgot to mention, I think earlier we were talking about applying to grad schools. You can always email the department or like some grad advisor. You can find someone to email and ask them for a fee waiver because sometimes it's really hard to find out if they even offer that and sometimes they don't advertise that because they try to like not I mean it's a school like they they want your money but if you're applying to a ton of different schools an $80 application fee every single time and sending your GRE scores and everything adds up so the worst they can tell you is no we don't offer that and then you don't lose anything but if you get a response that says sure here's like a promo code you can use or something like that that definitely helps so you should always try to ask And so one of the last questions, um, what if someone doesn't have the perfect 4.0 GPA basically and they wanna to go to grad school and how competitive it is, what else should they be highlighting? How, what else should they really be focusing on to make sure that they're competitive? Your purpose statement. I, th I will stand by it. I think that is like one of the most important parts of your application, um, you know, tell your story, tell, um, you know, I guess you don't need to say like why you have such a, a lower GPA, but like, you know, if your story involves progress, um, then they want to know about that. So like, you can say that in your statement of purpose, um, you know, like your, your, your motivation, your interests and, and things like that. And like, so yeah, I think spend a lot of time on your statement of purpose. I'll say, please don't let a low GPA or whatever low means to you, 
um, deter you at all. Because I had, I know many a person that I was friends with in undergrad have a, have a lower GPA, but when it came time to do our senior research during our senior year, they were amazing. They did the best projects. So the grad schools really are looking for a whole person. They're looking for, are you enthusiastic? Do you have a good purpose statement? Exactly, which is so important, Melissa. Um, do you have good recommendations? Do you have a presser that you're really close with who can write you a very good recommendation? Like there's all these things and not just about your GPA. So do, do not let that scare you away from, from, even if you think, oh, I have a low GPA, therefore I can't do research. That is not true. That is completely false. So don't let that scare you. Also, if you can get involved in any research while you're an undergraduate, that will always help because at the end of the day, when you get into grad school, they want to know, can you or can you not do research? They know you can do classes, but can you do research? Yeah, one thing is classes beyond just passing them, understanding the material, they matter a lot less in grad school. Like you still obviously want to do as best you can, you want to learn the material, but they're really interested in your research abilities. And so if you can prove that you can do that, and also if you can have like a, a someone professor like Jeffrey was saying to write and explain that you know you can do this you did really well uh you know maybe the grades don't particularly reflect this but this person's really bright and they've been able to do x y and z and are teaching their you know their tutoring and they're working with their friends and everything that can also really really help oh Jenna that's so important like if you have like other like you're doing so many, like as, a, as an undergrad, you're also doing so many things on top of classes. Like maybe you're a tutor, maybe you do these other things that don't necessarily reflect in your GPA, but are so important that grad schools want to hear about. So yeah, that's really important. And when, because I keep talking, and actually, actually, when you ask your professors to write a recommendation for you, you can like, and a lot of them actually will ask for like, can you give me a list of everything that you've done? Can you give me your CV completely unedited, basically just throw everything at it because they, they want to write a long letter. They want to write a letter that really gets to the meat of you basically, because they know that applications are so, they can be so quantitative basically. And that's more than what you really need to succeed. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask like potential recommenders if they can write you a good recommendation letter, because sometimes they know you really well, but they also have like a really busy schedule and they won't be able to dedicate as much time and you'd rather know that and not, again, use all your time um, as your main resource to apply to a school and then you get kind of subpar recommendation letters. So definitely ask them so that you save both of you time. Um, yeah, and then also grad school is just kind of a big jumble of a ton of challenges. So if you can show how you've already faced challenges in undergrad and overcome them, that's definitely something that sets you apart obviously having a, like a good GPA is amazing and like you should be proud of that if you do, but don't let it deter you from applying because you probably have a lot more life experience than kind of like the cookie cutter 4.0 GPA. So like we just close it off too, is there any last minute advice that you would give yourself knowing what you know now about grad school back when you were applying or when you were entering? I would say um, worst case scenario, your first round of grad school applications, you don't get in anywhere, which is what happened with me. Uh, don't be discouraged. The admissions uh, numbers, how many people they admit and what kind of people they admit changes a lot from year to year uh, through a variety of factors well beyond your control maybe one research group lost a lot of people and that's not the kind of research that you wrote about in your letter. It's not the kind of thing that you would be doing. Uh, so they just didn't let in many exoplanet people in that year or something like that or any number of things. Just, you know, take a breath, take a little break. Uh, you have already done a lot of work and try again next year. There's, it's, it's not the end of the world if you don't get right into graduate school at age 22. Uh, there's, you still have plenty of time. I agree. I went through the same scenario. Um, just, uh, you know, if you, if you want to go to grad school, um, then, then keep trying, you know, 
it's not just like you said, it's not the end of the world. Take a break, keep going. I'd probably tell myself, don't be afraid. There's, you know, the big stim in my grad school was that it can always, it's so hard, it's hard work and it is, but it can also be really rewarding and really fun. And you meet so many new people and with such interesting research. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid. I think I would say, um, well, also agreeing with Jeffrey, don't be afraid, but definitely just try to find at least a few people that are in classes with you or just in the same program that you know if you have to vent that like it's welcome and they will also probably have to vent to you and like imposter syndrome is so real and everyone probably feels like oh my god they're just gonna kick me out any day now but everyone's probably struggling with the same or similar stuff so it's okay to just text someone or email and be like hey i'm struggling and then you'll probably get a response that says me too do you want to talk about it so Never be afraid to like reach out to someone. Yes, imposter syndrome is real. Many times I felt that as well. I'm I'm gonna um, go back to something I said earlier and just emphasize like making time for your your hobbies and yourself. You know, don't let grad school. Um, just take over your life. You know, you're still a human being that has all these uh, different parts of you. So, you know, keep, keep those things if you have them. All right, well, thank you to all of our panelists so much for sharing and your advice with all of us. I know this would help me a lot when I was starting grad school if I had it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this recording and we'll, it'll be sent around the listservs and up on our YouTube whenever I get it. <laughs> So see you guys next week. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks for this together, Jenna. That was great. Bye. Bye. Bye.